Hi class, this uh, presentation is on Socrates, about his, his life and his philosophy and his early on his interactions with uh, the sophist. Uh, Socrates is one of the most famous names in, in the whole of philosophy and really if you get a chance to read uh, one of Plato's dialogues or more than one. Socrates is the main character in all those dialogues and he's really a pretty interesting and inspirational figure. So we'll try to uh, talk about what his ideas were and how he went about doing philosophy. Okay, to start things off we'll look at We'll try to situate this look at Socrates in, in terms of what we've done so far. So uh, we're looking at the history of philosophy. We, we did an intro uh, to the subject uh, as one video. Then we did a video on the pre-Socratics. And this one is uh, dedicated to Socrates and the sophist. We could say this is the second stage second major stage in the, the history of philosophy. It's the interest uh, that engaged Socrates and the sophists is different from that that engaged the pre-Socratics. If you remember, the pre-Socratics were interested in try to, trying to explain the natural world, the physical world, trying to account for the basic elements and trying to explain uh, the nature of change. And in the end, we saw that there was still a lot that was unresolved and there was no unanimity uh, achieved by the pre-Socratics. So you know, it could be that philosophy almost exhausted itself in that area. And so there's a kind of shift of interest here when we get to Socrates and the sophist. Philosophy has now is going to be for the a certain time situated primarily in the city of the Greek city state of Athens. And to start with, it's the the questions are moving away from natural philosophy to questions more concerned with human beings. So it's kind of a shift from trying to understand the outer world, the external world, to looking at our inner world. Primarily, what can we know and what are the limits of what we can know? In philosophy, we, we call that field of philosophy epistemology, after the Greek episteme for knowledge. And again, that question seems natural because of uh, so many different opinions about uh, the world appeared during the time of the pre-Socratics and nobody could uh, claim to have the, the, the single truth about it all. So it was natural that people would maybe begin to be skeptical about the ability of human beings to understand truth of that nature. The second question that interested Socrates and the sophist was how should we live? And again, this is how to live as an individual. What is the basis of the good life? Or what can we know about the best way to try to live our life? And we could say that that branch of philosophy is ethics. So ethics and epistemology, that's going to be the, the new focus for Socrates and the sophist. Uh, here I've included uh, a rendering of Athens. Uh, actually, this is uh, the Acropolis uh, on a hill in the, the center of Athens. And just to, to give some feel of what the atmosphere must have been, I mean, to live during this time and in this place, so Socrates did uh, a lot of his philosophizing or his conversations he had with people uh, on the Acropolis. 
and you can see the, the the monumental character of the architecture and uh it sort of said something about human accomplishment and that humans were capable of building something like this and a, a kind of monument that would stand withstand uh, the vicissitudes of time and uh, even still today although this is primarily in ruins but a lot of it is still there and people still go to visit it it's kind of uh, stands at the beginning of what we trace uh, back to the ancient Greeks in terms of Western civilization. Uh, the time period that we're uh, looking at when we look at the time of Socrates and the Sophist is uh, could be said to be the, the golden age of ancient Greece. And this was a period of flourishing, flowering of Greek culture. I mean, the achievements in the arts and uh, the architecture which we've just looked at uh, in drama the great playwrights dramatists uh, Aeschylus Euripides and Sophocles and and then in philosophy the some of the most famous names in philosophy Socrates Plato and Aristotle all lived in uh, in direct succession I mean in this time period so it was a really uh, interesting age and was kind of short-lived. I mean, it, it came into prominence, I mean, during this time period. It was kind of the central, the center of the, the ancient world, cultural center. Uh, and But by the time Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, when by the time Aristotle dies, it's no longer has the same status in the ancient world. and uh, after this time period, we won't hear as much about the contributions that come out of Athens. We'll start with uh, the Sophist. And uh, as I, I said before, this Athens was at this time a kind of the cultural center of the ancient world. And scholars or people who were interested in making a career for themselves would gravitate towards Athens to come there because that's kind of where everything was happening and uh, the sophists were no exception to that they were we call them teachers or uh, philosophers practical philosophers and they came to Athens to, to make a name and a life for themselves primarily they were uh, teachers of rhetoric and uh, they had opinions about lots of things but they made their living by teaching rhetoric which was uh, you could say the, the art of persuasion oral speaking uh, Athens had recently become uh, a democracy and in a kind of pure democracy uh, even though it didn't accept didn't acknowledge slaves didn't acknowledge women as citizens but it was a had a kind of democratic structure and if you wanted to take your place in Athenian society you had to be able to speak in front of large numbers of people and the the sophists were good at teaching that and so they were valued because of that uh, I'm not going to say too much about their particular philosophical positions. They're, I mean, on the next slide, I'm going to talk about how they're all kind of skeptics and relativist in terms of values and so forth. But the three that are mentioned in our text are Protagoras, Gorgias, and Thrasymachus. Protagoras is famous for having said that man is the measure of all things. So it's uh, human beings decide what's true and what's important and, and so forth. Gorgias gave three options in terms of well, in terms of what we could know about the truth, so which kind of cover all the bases. First of all, it could be the case that there is no truth, truth doesn't exist. Or secondly, let's say truth does exist, but 
no one's capable of understanding it. Or thirdly, let's say truth exists and somebody could understand it, but they couldn't convince anyone else that what they understood was the truth. So if, even if you knew the truth, you couldn't communicate it to other people. It kind of all amounts to the, the same thing, you know, is that human beings are very limited in terms of what they're capable of knowing in terms of the truth. Thrasymachus had the most radical position, and for him, truth just meant that you were in a position to determine what was true, and that the powerful uh, people in society, in politics and so forth, they determine what's true for other people, and then other people just have to accept that. So for Thrasymachus, the, the best thing to do is to become one of the powerful people. Uh, we'll try to keep in mind that uh, the Sophist and Socrates, too, come uh, along after the time of the pre-Socratic. So, as we said earlier, it's kind of natural that skepticism would appear because uh, it didn't seem like the pre-Socratics had been able to discover truth about the natural world that, that everyone could accept. So, the Sophist kind of adopted skepticism uh, a position you know in, in with respect to what we can know as human beings so they seriously doubted that we can know the truth about just about anything uh, hand in hand with skepticism you could say is relativism or you could say even if there are some things that you could say are true it's always relative or it's conditional it depends on where you're at or what period of history it is or, or or who you are so even if you could say there is some truth that we can know as human beings it's always relative to a certain situation there's no absolute truth applicable to everywhere and everyone and relativism is usually a term which applies in ethics so you would say if what people accept as moral values or ideals you could say that that's relative to where you happen to come from and uh, if that's the case and you know that would have been a shock for people who hadn't lived anywhere else except in Athens because they it's what everybody believed all the time that the values and the traditions and the culture that they the Athenians had, they had a kind of narrow point of view, and the Sophists came from different lands, so they they quickly made it known that in different lands, the people had different viewpoints about all these things. So you'd say, well, there's nothing which is really necessarily true, but it's all, all moral ideals are also relative. No objective standards exist. And if that's the case, if there is no truth, no ultimate truth in the, the area of human conduct, then uh, why not do what you want to do? I mean, or do what sort of serves your own advantage. And that's frequently kind of the, the point of view that uh, the sophists took. So... They may have been valued for their skill at teaching rhetoric, but after a time, the, the sophists weren't so popular in Athens because it became apparent that they didn't really stand for anything, uh, anything very positive at any rate. Well, this is just a, a bust of Socrates, so you get some idea of what he might have looked like. And we see the, the time frame here is uh, born in 470 BC and dies in 399. So that's 5th century, uh, getting into the, just on the verge of the, the 4th century is the, the time frame here. Let's say a little bit more about Socrates on the next page. Uh, just a few details about Socrates the man. Uh, I think 
if you read about him, you'll see that he was a pretty charismatic figure. Uh, in some of the descriptions, get the idea that he was physical. Not uh, so pretty exactly, but, uh, but a robust, hearty individual, durable. Served as a foot soldier in, in one of the wars and uh, was said to be uh, with with others would uh, drink a good bit but never showed any signs of intoxication. He was not a noble like so many of the other philosophers, pre-Socratics plus Plato and Aristotle both came from noble families, but Socrates was uh, came from common origins. And uh, nonetheless, he was able through the strength of his character and his intellect, I mean, to rise to a position of prominence in Athenian society. Morally, we get the sense that he was uh, pure. I mean, that's a strong word, but it kind of applies that he had an impeccable character. He couldn't that he refused to compromise his principles regardless of how much uh, static he would take about his views and there were occasions when he was the, almost the only one in the city who would criticize uh, a, a certain move because he he saw it as unjust uh, and so but he was willing to stand by his his judgments in those cases what was he about? I mean, he was his, clearly he felt like he had a mission or he was driven to always seek the truth with all the resources at his disposal. And he would say again and again that he would follow the arguments wherever they might lead. So when he was trying to figure something out, he wouldn't stop because he thought it was going to take him someplace dangerous, but uh, he would follow it. Mentally, he was uh, uh, capable of sustained concentration for long periods of time to reach uh, an understanding about something that puzzled him. There's stories about him. Uh, he'd be, he could become transfixed if there was something he was trying to work out and he would just stand in the same place uh, all day or through the night into the next morning until he had resolved what he was trying to understand. That's a, a pretty fascinating uh, characteristic, and I don't know that I know anybody in the, the present day, I mean, who is capable of that. And uh, he attracted followers, you know, and to, to himself, people were attracted to his activities and the conversations that he engaged in. So he attracted people through the strength of his character and through the, the power of his intellect. And a lot of the, the brightest minds in Athens were intrigued by him and would follow him around and became his pupils. Uh, I think we've already said, but uh, philosophically, Socrates was not at all interested in speculations about the nature of the physical world. You think he, he says at some point he was early on, but he quickly gave up or feeling that it wasn't worth pursuit. For him, all the important questions were those focused on what it meant to be a human being, on like what human nature was, or what truth was, or, or what goodness was. Those were the, the questions that interested him. He's pretty unique in the, the history of philosophy for not having written down anything. Uh, philosophy for him was a lived activity, and uh, he didn't leave any record of what his ideas were. And we kind of have to rely on others to sort of know what he talked about or what his ideas were but for him philosophy was uh, lived um, in, in the on the streets engaged in conversations with other people discussions about the questions that he thought it was important for human beings to be thinking about and talking about knowing the truth was 
uh, about those questions is what drove him. And we could say uh, that he kind of embodied this definition that we gave of philosophy early on. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. It looked like uh, Socrates was the, the living embodiment of, of that definition. He was, uh, he loved uh, wisdom more than anything else. Socrates was generally opposed to the, the positions of the sophist. Uh, they shared the same city, so they were uh, aware of each other. And on some occasions in some of Plato's dialogues, you can see Socrates engage uh, one or the other of the sophist in, in conversations. But in general, Socrates didn't share their skepticism. He didn't share the, their same beliefs about relativism and all. I mean, it's good to be skeptical, I mean, but not to the point where you don't think that there's any truth. And to some extent, relativism is also applicable. But Socrates clearly believed that it was possible for human beings to know something about the truth. And although certainly admittedly it was difficult to come to know anything that was true and therefore you could say that it was very rare to find anyone who actually knew what was true so it was very difficult to get to the truth it took a lot of work so for him it wasn't surprising that there were so many opinions different opinions about things that didn't mean there wasn't any truth it, it meant more that it was difficult to, to achieve the truth. So therefore, and, you know, kind of acknowledgement that few people were willing to do the hard work that's necessary to dig through all the, the layers that you have to dig through uh, in order to finally get to uh, some, some idea of what the truth actually is. That So this belief that Truth is something that we can know, so it's worth still striving for. Uh, also applied to truth about values, truth about uh, the good life, or knowing something about what the good life might consist of for a human being. Again, difficult to determine, but nonetheless, uh, with hard work and application and discussion with others, we should be able to figure out some some basic basic things about uh, how to how to live and like what's a good type of life and and what isn't so good. Uh, in a number of respects, Socrates was similar with uh, to the sophist the the way he went about philosophy the. The kinds of questions that he asked, his willingness to question things that generally people just took for granted. So there wasn't much difference uh, between him and the sophist in that regard. And uh, it's also true that some of the Athenians actually thought of Socrates as a, a sophist or thought that he was like the sophist. But they were also different, uh, primarily different in terms of what the, the objectives of their activities were. So agreed, they both, both asked hard questions, questioned established views, argued different sides of issues and so forth. But the sophist really had a more, uh, their objective was to just established that everything was relative and that no one could know the truth anyhow. So for the sophist, it became more a matter of teaching people how to win arguments. And it wasn't like there was a, one side of the argument was better than the other. It was just a question of having a better argument to support the side that you wanted or the side that benefited you. So the sophists were interested more in winning than they were at getting at the truth, since they didn't believe there was a truth to get at. And they pursued their own self-interest or points of view that benefited them. Socrates was uh, equally skilled in argumentation, if not more skilled than the, 
and the best sophist, but uh, his goal was was always to discover uh, what the truth was, uh, to to come to try and find a better understanding, and uh, and in particular, you know, to know the truths relative to living as a, a human being, sort of what did it, what was the good life, and so forth. So for him, winning the argument was not the the main thing. It didn't matter whether you won or not. Uh, what mattered was whether or not you could get closer to the truth. It was you could say that with Socrates, if you wanted to engage in a discussion with Socrates, uh, you kind of had to check your ego at the door because it wasn't about protecting your ego. It didn't matter that that you held a particular uh, opinion about things. What mattered was whether or not you could defend your opinion or whether your opinion was close to the truth. And the sophists had a hard time accepting defeat. And a lot of times they would hold on to their positions even when they no longer looked reasonable. So that's a kind of defensive position. Uh, if Socrates claimed that we can know the truth, uh, at least in some respects, then we could ask him, where might you look for it? It's kind of like the burden of proof would be more on Socrates than it would be on the sophist. I mean, it's the, the arguments for skepticism are are pretty obvious. It's obvious that uh, there's everyone has a different opinion about things and so forth. If Socrates wants to maintain that there is a truth that human beings can know, then can he give an example of what it might look like or at least indicate where we could take a look for it? He doesn't give an example exactly. I mean, he does if you study uh, his dialogues uh, uh, long enough, but uh, the direction he was pretty clear about. So if you wanted to know the truth, you should be looking within yourself and turn within. Uh, answers to the most important questions for us as human beings are not to be sought in the external world can't look for them outside yourself, but you have to seek them sort of within yourself, internally. His two favorite sayings kind of reflect this, this inner direction. First was, know thyself. This is not, it's often associated with Socrates, uh, but I believe it was not unique to him. I think it was an inscription on the the door to the temple of Delphi in the ancient Greek, uh, the ancient Greek world. So, but know thyself first and foremost. You have to under before you understand things about the world. You have to know who you are as a person. The second saying is the unexamined life is not worth living. So you need to question yourself. You know that means not question other people, not question things externally, but sort of try and understand your st yourself first and foremost, that uh, to live a life that's worthy of being lived, I mean, self-examination seems to be part of it. Uh, try and figure things out. So the, the basic principle could be expressed as all knowledge begins with self-knowledge. You want to understand things, you have to start by knowing yourself. So all knowledge begins with self-knowledge. Most important things we want to try and understand, we should begin by trying to take a look within. For Socrates, when you do take a look within, what are you going to see? What is in the inner world? And for him, it's the, the psyche or we translate psyche. Psyche, I don't know, for the Greeks, I'm not sure it meant soul, it just meant psyche, which is the inner world. But we translate it as soul. And you'd say for, for Socrates, the psyche is where you would find two different things. First of all, you would find your intellect, 
is in the inner world. And it's on the basis of your intellect that you're capable of thinking about things and coming to an understanding of things. So it's on the basis of how well you understand things or how much you've thought about things that you'd be considered a wise person or a foolish person. Secondly, the other thing that's an inner a trait of ourselves and that you would say resides in the psyche as well is is your own character and here character refers to moral character and it's on the basis of your character that you would be determined to be either a good person or a bad person so there are many ways of evaluating yourselves in life. I mean, and clearly for, from the Socratic point of view, external features, you know, whether you looked well, you know, you were gifted athletically or, or something like that, wouldn't really be very important in the, the final analysis of who you were, what your worth was. But the, the inner characteristics of a person were more important, whether you were a wise or a foolish person, or whether you were a good or a bad person. From this, you can say there's two questions emerge that interest Socrates, and you know, which we've already indicated, but now we see that they're, they're related to this inner world. The first is, what is good? And what can we know? And if you combine them, you get what can we know about the good life? So we have the direction that we're looking. We're looking within. Uh, and the, the next thing we kind of have to understand for Socrates is how he understood the process. I say the process of self-discovery or the process of uh, discovering, coming to a better understanding of something. And for him, that was a kind of dialectical process. So you practice dialectic. This, for him, was always practiced with other people. And uh, it was not something you did by yourself, but it was kind of uh, have a conversation, you know, or a disciplined conversation. Not just casual con conversation, but some sort of disciplined, rigorous conversation between people. And almost always in the dialogues that we read about Socrates, it starts with some question that uh, you think is interesting or you think that there's something that needs to be understood so you would begin to have a conversation about it and so you would have a, a dialogue which involved going back and forth questions and answers it would always start with people expressing their opinions and then subjecting those opinions to mutual examination and if it if your opinion didn't quite measure up, somebody would point out a shortcoming, then you you try to find some better uh, expression for it or some something which was closer to the truth. So these dialogues always started from the opinions and a kind of critical examination or challenge to defend or clarify the ideas that we have. And you on a, on a lot of these dialogues you'd see you wouldn't Necessarily at the end of the recorded dialogue, you might not know exactly what it was you were trying to understand, but you would be closer to it. And that seemed to be the aim, is to get rid of the misconceptions that we have. As the discussion or the dialogue goes forward, the dialectic process plays itself out. The idea is that you gradually get closer to what the truth might be. It might be a long process, ultimately, to try and figure out what, how things actually stood. This whole method, you know, of back and forth conversation, critical examination, being willing to examine your ideas together with other people, became known as the Socratic 
uh, way of doing philosophy, the Socratic method. I think we could say that uh, the goal of this method was to come to a clear definition of what something was. Uh, a lot of the dialogues were would would follow a, a question like that. I mean, it would be a question: what What is piety? What does What does piety mean? Or what is justice really? And again, you would start with uh, people's opinions, and you would subject those opinions to critical examination, and gradually you would get closer to uh, an accurate definition of what something actually was and that would be a form of a definition the eye of a definition the idea of a definition always seems a bit academic but we say that a definition is supposed to say what something is and this is what Socrates was after uh, when he tried to get people to clarify uh, what they meant when they said something or when they talked about something what did they really mean by that and they would have to clarify their own views about it so trying to get people to clear to form formulate clear and con concise concepts of what the words meant uh, he um, he believed that the difficulty was that our understanding is vague and confused about most things and really what we're working to accomplish is to clarify uh, ideas that we have I mean we have opinions and opinions aren't uh, they're not the truth by any stretch but they're not entirely false either I mean but they're they need to be clarified they need to be made more concrete and the way in which the, the dialectical process worked was to get rid of the misconceptions that are involved in the ideas that we have about things. So we get rid of those misconceptions. We move forward in terms of our understanding. Now the Greek term for this progress was elenchus, uh, this sort of moving forward by removing sort of the misconceptions that you have moving towards the truth by getting rid of uh, the wrong ideas that are in the way of it. Socrates referred to himself as an intellectual midwife. So this is, what's he mean by this? And he's clearly, he's aiming at not to be a teacher in the ordinary sense, not to feel like you can actually teach people things, but an intellectual midwife is somebody who assists in the process of coming to the truth for the, the student, but not actually giving the student the truth. So you assist, the truth is something which already exists within the the person who's who's trying to understand it, but it has to be brought forth. It has to be born. You could say that everybody knows the truth when they see it, or they recognize the truth when they come to see it. But one has to undergo this kind of labor uh, to to get to it. The truth resides within us, but it has to be brought out. And say this the teacher can't give the truth to the student, but he can help the student to find it in themselves. So to teach is to provide conditions within which a student can discover the truth for himself or herself. That's a difficult role for a teacher, and uh, any of you who are interested in teaching might well know. I mean, the, the temptation is to pass on what you know to other people, uh, to students. But uh, the best way for anyone to learn anything is to do the work that's necessary for them to uh, come to it on their own. And so a good teacher is one who creates conditions within which one might discover the truth for themselves. 
So Socrates was this inspirational teacher, and he was certainly an inspiration to his uh, pupil, Plato. Um, uh, so Socrates is known uh, in some respect by how his life ended, uh, just as much as by how he actually lived it and so forth. Plato records the events at the end of Socrates' life. He wrote a, a trilogy uh, of dialogues. And we've said before, I think a dialogue is kind of dramatic presentation of philosophical events or discussions. In, in Plato's dialogue, Socrates was invariably presented as the one who understood better than anybody else in the dialogue. But in the, in the dialogue, you have all these different characters who represent different ideas and you have interactions between them and so forth. The three dialogues, uh, that are involved in the last day, days of Socrates were, first of all, the apology. So Socrates, because he, he rubs some people the wrong way in ancient city of Athens was called up on charges and uh, there was a trial. He was accused of corrupting the youth of Athens, of not respecting the, the gods of the city and so forth. And, neither of which seems to have actually been the case. But uh, anyhow, he was brought on trial. It was uh, a democratic situation. So there's like a jury of uh, 500 people. Socrates defended himself. And the sentiment was kind of against him because the feeling was that philosophy was doing damage to the city. And because it was teaching people to think independently and not just do what they'd always, what citizens had always done. So anyhow, at the, the verdict, uh, after the, the cases were heard, the verdict was, uh, I don't know, what do they say, 280 to 220 or something against Socrates. At which point he could have proposed a kind of penalty for himself that the, the jury would have accepted. And, uh, but he was not, uh, prone to compromise. So instead of giving the jury a kind of out, he sort of kind of threw the verdict back in their face and said that the penalty he should get was that the city should give him a, a yearly pension for all the good he had done for the city. So they weren't likely to do that. And since they'd already found him guilty and instead they, they gave him the death penalty. And so, uh, then the, the second dialogue was, there was a time when Socrates waited in prison. I mean, because they, they couldn't, they couldn't carry out the death sentence for some, for religious reasons or something. And his friends would come and see him and his friend Credo offered to help him escape. And he could easily have arranged it and Socrates could have gone to another neighboring country. But Socrates felt like that was not a just solution to the problem that he if he wanted to do that he should have done that back during the trial and he didn't so he was he respected the city and he didn't want to violate its laws so he was willing to see the penalty out finally the day came and the, the last dialogue is the Phaedo it's also the longest dialogue and sort of the story of the accounts of the last day and the uh, his students are, many of them are sad, some of them crying and weeping, and Socrates is asking them, you know, why are you so sad? And, you know, he wasn't afraid to die. And he didn't, he pretty much believed that his soul would live on after death. And, uh, but his students, they were good philosophers. They said, well, how can you be so sure? And uh, how do you know that that's what happens? Nobody knows. And so, 
So then they begin this lengthy discussion, you know, about all the, the possibilities in terms of what happens when you die and whether or not, you know, the soul just leaves the body and that's the end, or whether the soul, the body dies and the soul goes elsewhere. Uh, and they they explored all the, the different options, and Socrates, you know, said what better way to spend the last day than to have this discussion. At the end, it's still, you know, unresolved, but it seems pretty clear that Socrates still believed that that his soul would live on after death and that death wasn't uh, the end, that there was something in a human being that would live on after the death of the body. So in the end, he calmly drinks uh, the hemlock poison and dies with uh, great composure. And uh, in, as a result, his image is kind of fixed in history which uh, I'll comment on in the next page. Uh, here's one of the, the famous pictures of uh, Socrates at the moment when he's uh, ready to drink the, the hemlock poison uh, on this day. And when he does, I mean, you could say it's it's heroically, it's tragic, and Socrates dies as a, a martyr to philosophy. Uh, Plato's telling of the story and his rendering of the, the character of Socrates in this kind of immortalizes character, immortalizes Socrates as this uh, uh, sort of human embodiment of the, the love of wisdom. Uh, that you would say is the philosopher. Ultimately, Socrates was somebody who lived his philosophy and uh, and also died for it as well. So it's uh, Plato's story. Make sure that that's the image that we have going forward uh, of Socrates. <laughs>